Hi, Hap. Nice to be with you today. Hey, Tashin. So um, we've been interacting on Twitter for a little while. I've quite enjoyed your presence. And you are, uh, you know, a little while ago, you very kindly volunteered to be in this sort of Twitter fight with me to let me pick a fight with you. And I think we had good fun with that. And that may come up at some point in this conversation. But the main reason I wanted to talk today is, uh, you know, I think you're sort of a man of mystery. I love your presence. I love the things you share, but I want to get to know you better and where you come from and give people an idea of your your practice background and your values and the things that you're exploring in your life and kind of get a deep dive into that. So uh, I wonder if you might start just by telling us uh, about yourself, your history, your background, um, and especially your practice history, but anything else that you feel is really relevant to getting to know you better. Sure. Yeah, I can do that. It's a little bit, I'm old, so it's kind of a long story, but, um, you ha- you can have as long as you want. <laughs> I, uh, in terms of practice history, I met my, the person that I would regard as a root teacher when I was 15. And, uh, I sort of immediately was drawn to him. I was very, very spiritual when I was like a, early teen and preteen, much more so than I am now, and very kind of spiritually advanced, you know. And uh, and so I met this guy who was a teacher of Advaita and of yoga in a kind of tradition that came from Kashmir, from the uh, north of India. And at that time, yoga wasn't what it is now. It wasn't really... uh, you couldn't, there weren't yoga studios everywhere. So it was, seemed a little more esoteric, I guess. And I was very drawn to him and studied with him. He was Czech. I guess I can say his name. His name was Jean Klein. Uh, he died some years ago, but um, he lived in the south of France and would come. I was living in Southern California at the time, and he would come and sort of give dialogues. He would sit in silence for a long time, and then he would open up to questions and kind of explore non-duality with people and uh, I and then occasionally he would give yoga retreats and I had no real interest in yoga but I started studying yoga because I loved him so much and then eventually I became closer to him and started kind of organizing retreats for him in my 20s and then I ended up in Europe bumming around and he needed a cook and so I became his personal cook in the south of France and lived with him and studied with him kind of personally. And I felt very special about that Um, because there was a whole sort of cool community around him of like cool European bohemian spiritual people that was all very attractive to me as a young Californian. Um, Then I ended up coming back to the States and uh, he became sick. He had Parkinson's and, uh, and had a series of strokes. And he was a person who I, I admired. It's hard for me to really describe how much I admired him, but in addition to sort of being a, a guru to me, he was also, he, he was like a kind of um, old school European gentleman uh, in this way that, and he was, he was super knowledgeable about millions of things. He was a chess master. He played the violin. He concertized in Europe. He was, I just really, really thought he was fantastic. And I really wanted to be like him. And, um, he, in his illness, he sort of was brought, uh, completely low. And I, he was in Southern California at that time. And I I went and lived with him and and cared for him in his final illness. And, um, you know, at first he kind of, he, he uh, stopped really being able to speak English anymore and could only speak French. And then the French on bad days, the French would go away and he could only speak German, which I didn't speak German, but he would talk German to me and he lost his kind of charisma and, uh, he lost his um, he lost his wisdom actually, 
in a certain way. And, and then he kind of, you know, he lost his ability to really manage his body very well. And I fed him uh, with a spoon towards the end and uh, bathed him. And I actually wiped his ass for him. My, my first and only experience of wiping somebody else's ass was my teacher. And uh, then I, I took off from that. I was in Portland when he died. And it's a funny thing to say, but in a way, his death was kind of the greatest sort of spiritual gift that he gave me because it really catalyzed a period of great doubt. And, uh, and I had no practice for a while after that. I had been practicing very intensely. You know, I had a very kind of, I had a little esoteric square of carpet that I sat on full lotus and would burn tons of incense and practice yoga for three hours every morning, yoga and pranayama. And I was very, uh, very, very spiritual and, and had all kinds of, you know, delicious uh, awakening experiences, you might say, through that and, and thought I was, I was hot shit. And, uh, and after his death, I kind of, I didn't have any practice for some time. This is in my late 20s. And then at some point in my early 30s, I was back in uh, the Bay Area. And I had a friend who was practicing at a Zen center there. And I hadn't really had any interest in Zen, actually. But um, I kind of walked in the door just for something to do and out of curiosity. And, and eventually I kind of went down to the the Zendo and, and took Zazen instruction, you know, which they offered every week and, and sort of tried sitting on a cushion. And, uh, and then I really liked that. It really was a space where I could just be quiet and uh, feel my way through some of what I needed to feel, I guess. And through that, I, uh, you know, became a Zen student, um, as I guess many people do who wander into urban Zen centers and uh, had, you know, a few teachers there and, um, and practiced uh, and continue to practice pretty earnestly uh, in that context. So, yeah, that's, that maybe brings you up to date with kind of who I am and where I've been. How long did you, have you been doing Buddhist practice? You said it was since your early 30s, yes? Yeah, I'm 55. So that's 25 years, something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A little over 20. What was, what was kind of the shape of doing 25 years of Zen practice? Um... Well, I, uh, after I realized that it was something I really vibed with, I, it seemed like the thing to do was to take vows. I mean, if I'd been in a different phase in my life, I probably would have gone and been a monastic, but, uh, I had, I was running a business and stuff and had, you know, responsibilities. So I didn't feel I could do that. So, but I did, uh, study with a wonderful teacher who administered the precepts to me, uh, which maybe we can talk about a little more later, mm -hmm. and, um, and became involved in Sangha and, you know, made a lot of Dharma friends. And, and I sat a lot uh, in the kind of middle phase of Studying Zen, I would try to sit four sessions a year, every season, and that, for me, was a really wonderful, wonderful practice. Uh, I could say that eventually, I kind of I drew, separated from my preceptor, the teacher who was my preceptor, uh, basically because I think she sort of believed in 
enlightenment or we, we argued about it a lot anyway. And uh, that wasn't a good teaching for me, I think, partly because of my own background and causes and conditions. And then I kind of hooked up with another person in that community who was uh, a teacher, who was my teacher, who was a, a dear Zen teacher to me and a dear, dear Dharma friend. Uh, and he actually died a few years ago, maybe it's uh, three years ago now, which uh, was kind of a big loss to me. Is that is that answering the question of the shape of Zen practice? Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. there something more specific you want to know? Well, just, um, yeah, I think you answered it just fine. Uh, just wanted to fill in a little bit more what that looked like for you. and. Um, I'd be curious to ask for a little more detail about this dispute that you had with your preceptor. Like what, what was the view that she held and how did you see it? She, um, her view was a little, a little murky. I can, I don't know if I could speak directly to her view, but I could say that she, she wasn't careful about saying things which suggested that there was some kind of cataclysmic change that you could go through or would go through in the course of spiritual practice, which would make you somehow different from other people. Uh, and in our private discussions, I would often, in, in public, I would often kind of challenge her on that because we were both students in the tradition of Dogen Zenji and therefore uh, theoretically followed the belief or the, the expression that uh, practice is not different from realization and realization is not different from practice. And that for me was really, really good medicine, was and is really good medicine. And um, so that was, I, I felt that I wanted, if I was gonna kind of, uh, have somebody guiding my practice. I wanted that person to be very, very clear that uh, practice realization is the bedrock. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Hmm. I'm trying to think. Um, I have the sense. And, and feel free to correct this or adjust it in any way you like, but I have the sense from reading your Twitter presence that maybe there's, there's two sides to you or two broad backgrounds or influences where on the one hand you've done extensive Zen practice and are sort of rooted in, in Buddhist practice. And then also it seems like, um, you know, uh, there's maybe influences or practices that are external to Buddhism and maybe you didn't find from Buddhism. Um, and I would be curious to ask about those as well and how you would characterize that and, and what the different practices are that you've done or been exposed to. And then of course, how those relate to Buddhism. So we, we can, we can take that step by step, but how, is that a fair characterization that you, you've had some influences outside of Buddhism as well? Yeah, that's a fair characterization. I mean, partly it's the persona, this persona, the Hap Savage persona is different from how I behave under my birth name uh, mm -hmm. in, in my Sangha. Um, I'm much more careful there. And I'm much more careful not to say anything that might um, potentially cause delusion. <laughs> Whereas under Hap Savage, I feel kind of free to uh, just talk whatever kind of shit pops into my head. So that's part of it. And I have lots and lots of interests, obviously. But I think what you might be sensing is that at a certain point in my... First of all, I did have a long practice, right, from mm -hmm. um, it was 15 years or something, which yes. was not Buddhist at all, and which was kind of, you know, tantric-ish uh, and Advaita, if I, I think that I can just use that word, right? Mm. Um so that definitely feeds into my understanding of all this stuff. 
And, um, but also at a certain point in my kind of Buddhist practice, I, I sat down and I really started trying to feel my way into what is the Dharma that I would want to pass on if I were going to pass something on. Um, and I realized that it was not, not Buddhist and there's nothing in the corpus of Buddhism and Mahayana and Zen that I really disagree with. Well, there are many, there are many Buddhisms. There probably are some things I disagree with, but, but on the whole, I think it's a great, it's, it's good for human beings. Um, and there are a few extra things that really aren't discussed very much within a, a Buddhist context in America and frankly, within the history of Buddhism. One of those is I personally feel a great sense of uh, reverence for the earth and for nature. And I kind of, I, something akin to worship or awe or all of that. And uh, there's, there's, Buddhism doesn't speak to that, although, you know, the historical Buddha is said to have sat under the bow tree. And there's even some evidence that, 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 Buddhas in the very, very earliest time of Buddhism were a kind of a community who identified as awakened ones, and each of them actually had their own tree. Um, so there is a there's a kind of a nature's mysticism that may have gotten lost along the way, um, but I feel that very strongly. So I realized that, and I thought, gosh, maybe I'm actually kind of a druid, and. Uh, and then I started feeling into it some more, and I realized that uh, I realized that I didn't say this earlier, but uh, I dropped acid for the first time when I was 16, and it's actually not possible for me to say what aspects of my sense of how reality works came from psychedelic experience and which aspects came from sitting on the cushion actually. Uh, so I had to say, well, maybe that's a teacher for me. Uh, not necessarily for everybody, but maybe it has been for me. And, um, and then one day I was kind of sitting, looking at my altar. I was, I'd been done meditating and I was looking at my altar and my altar at that time had um, a few things on it. But one of the things it had was a little chopstick holder in uh, white porcelain in the shape of a reclining naked woman. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, there is another aspect to my own practice and to the kind of form in which I've received teachings and that's the erotic. So I said, oh, maybe, maybe these four things, meditation, reverence for the living earth, psychedelic experience, and sexuality. Maybe these four things are kind of together, a kind of a dharma that I could really um, put my name on if I were going to put my name on the dharma. Mm. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Definitely. Yes, that's extremely helpful. And I think it might be useful to maybe take the latter three one by one, and then maybe come back to the Buddhism from there. So could you tell me, I, I'd be curious to hear this connection to nature, how you feel that and what that's been like for you. And yeah, like what druidry would mean to you to the extent that that's still a word you would use. Um, what, what that aspect of your practice and, and spirituality is like for you. I think um, some, I, somehow, uh, at some point in my 20s, I started wanting to go and be outside of cities and in the wilderness. And I, I first of all, would say that there were moments uh, kind of hiking down trails where I could feel that it, it felt to me as if the physical exertion and the just being among the more than human universe was changing me and making me a little more resilient 
and kind. So that was maybe my first sort of sense that uh, that the natural world, so-called, was a teacher of mine, if that makes sense. Um, and I would say that uh, without getting, without going too far afield, um, to the extent that I have a uh, religious feeling, what people think of as a religion, as a religious feeling, a, a sense of awe, I, I feel it towards, in a certain way, towards all of the, um, the interacting, the, the ecological interactions that make up um, the more than human world. And, and specifically, actually, I have a deep sense of awe in the face of randomness. So when uh, people talk about God in my presence, I, I, it's hard for me to really understand that. So I do a little mental translation where I, I use the word chance or randomness instead, and then everything they say makes sense. Because uh, I feel all the feelings that they seem to feel towards this word God, I feel about chance or randomness. So that's a, you know, a very kind of uh, intellectual or high level answer. I would also say that there was a moment uh, when I was backpacking by myself many years ago, uh, way off trail, traversing across a scree field. I was incredibly lonely. I used to get incredibly lonely. I, I, for some reason, I would go backpacking by myself, but I was so lonely that I would have to promise myself that if I could just get through one more night, I would get up and hike out and go home because it was just so horrible. And I, was, I felt, felt this incredible sense of isolation out there in the middle of nowhere. Nobody knew where I was and it was dangerous. And, and suddenly I looked down and I saw these ants kind of crawling across the scree and then I, I looked up and I saw there were there were birds flying in the sky. And then I looked around and I saw there were like, you know, these butterflies <laughs> flying around. And and suddenly I realized I was never going to be lonely again. I would never be alone again. Beautiful, beautiful. Can you say um, what... The, you you dropped this word earlier of druidry and like what that would mean to you and, and whether you still relate to that word? Yeah, I mean, yes, personally, I do relate to that word. And, uh, and it, uh, I like it because it's kind of ridiculous. And uh, there, there is a kind of a history to the word, which is, I don't know, is that interesting? Should I go into it? Go for it, please. Uh, the the uh, I think Tacitus or no Diodorus Siculus kind of mentions there being something called Druides in uh, the British Isles and, and Caesar actually also in his diaries when he comes back sort of says yeah there are these people called Druides and they worship oaks and they uh, do human sacrifice and so the word kind of entered the lexicon from there but. Uh, that was the only real mention. Nobody knows anything about what historical druids might or might not have been. And then kind of with the dawn of the Romantic era, uh, the word got kind of resuscitated and used by a bunch of people who were kind of in resistance against the dawning Industrial Revolution uh, to indicate some sort of sense of an old nature-centered spirituality. So I like that the word is a sort of free-floating signifier, but that which does represent a sense of a kind of resistance against the onward march of techno-capitalism. Um, and it also has, it always seems a little ridiculous and all the people who kind of have claimed to be Druids from the very earliest sort of uh, expounders of that in the, 18th century in England up to, you know, the kind of crazy, goofy hippies who uh, have ceremonies at standing stones. Uh, they all seem a little, a little um, ridiculous and are unafraid of being ridiculous. And 
I kind of like that. So as a religious identification, I kind of like identifying with something that no one could in their right mind really take seriously, uh, which of course people do take Buddhism very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Uh, that's just funny to me because uh, certainly I've been there myself. Um, and thank yeah, you. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So let's, let's move to psychedelics and, and drug use and um, you know, from, maybe a perspective of taking Buddhism too seriously. Uh, you could say, and we've talked about this before, but the fifth precept might say like, I, th I think most, most standard interpretations that I've heard of the fifth precept would be like no drug use, no psychedelics, none of that. Of course there are alternative interpretations as well. Um, but maybe you could speak to, uh, yeah, what, what do you see as the value of psychedelics and what, what role do they play for you and how have they kind of complemented a, a more traditional spiritual practice? Um, in my own life, uh, I've, I, I had a period of taking psychedelics in my kind of teens and early 20s, which I w w was out of curiosity. Um, and then I kind of, I had a long period of, um, of not, of, of attempting not to, of so-called not altering my consciousness in any way. Uh, at, at the time I believed that I was not altering my consciousness in any way. Now I would say that consciousness is kind of always altering and, you know, the difference in the weather or the difference in your internal hormones or changing your consciousness and consciousness is like not actually just one thing but but at the time i i it was very helpful for me to uh think that everyday mind was good enough and i didn't want to do anything to change it and i didn't drink coffee uh, i didn't smoke weed i didn't drink alcohol and i didn't shoot heroin or take you know poppers so uh and then slowly I kind of got, I don't know, I just got curious about it again. I kind of ran into some people who, I ran into a guy uh, who's actually a, a Zen teacher. Um, how much can I say about him? I will just say that he uh, he's an unusual person, and he, I had an interview with him where I sort of asked him about this, and he said, no, I have friends for whom taking psychedelics is a way, is really a way. And it's valid, and to criticize others for their practice would be non-Buddhist. That's what he said to me, and that uh, lodged a real kind of uh, question in me. So, um, so I started kind of experimenting again, and um, and came to the you know the view that I sort of expressed earlier, which is that I that. Altering consciousness is a way of coming to more intimate terms with the texture of consciousness, I would say. That's a simple way of putting it, and a very um, kind of non-mystical and non-mechanistic way. It's, consciousness is always altering anyway, and if you take a substance that alters consciousness, that's, that can be a practice. In order for it to be a practice, in my personal belief, you have to kind of have kind of a container around it. So actually, I, in addition to psychedelics, I drink sometimes. I smoke weed. I smoke tobacco. I, I, there are all kinds of substances. I drink coffee. Um, and I try to have kind of a container for that use. What does that mean? That means that I try to do it intentionally and deliberately. And it means also that I make sure to not do it uh, regularly. So I personally take about five months of the year where I don't vibe any substances that alter consciousness, unless you want to really take a wide view. I mean, I still eat. I still eat. <laughs> that alters consciousness. But uh, I don't, you know, particularly I don't take any of the substances that I've developed to kind of um, intimate relationship or habituation with. So that means things like 
alcohol, cannabis, tobacco, um, caffeine, I, I make sure to take, you know, somewhat less than half the year off from any of those just to kind of keep my relationship with them clear. That's what I do uh, in order to have a kind of a container. So that's a broad level view. I mean, I'm hesitant to talk about sort of like what have psychedelics given you because I just feel like it's really, there's a danger there of, um, of reifying insight, uh, which, I, which I think is, well, I think is really dangerous to do for people. Um, so I've gotten lots of insights from psychedelics. Do those insights make any difference? Uh, probably not. They're just part of the ebb and flow, the energetic ebb and flow of my existence. Um, I would say that there is an understanding of psychedelics, which is, uh, you know, you kind of take a psychedelic in order to have a cosmic experience, maybe even a, a premature Kensho type of experience. You know, that's an understanding that people have. And it's a common understanding within Buddhist circles that, yeah, sure, they, you know, famously Ram Dass gave, you know, six hits of acid to Neem Karoli Baba, and Neem Karoli Baba didn't seem to be affected by it and said, yeah, you know, it's interesting stuff, but it makes you enlightened, but it only works once. And these kind of stories kind of, uh, propagate. And um, there's another way of thinking about psychedelic use, which is what they call in the peyote way, getting right with the medicine, which is kind of just taking psychedelics more in the way that one might do morning zazen, whether you want to or not, whether you need it or not, to kind of let the medicine uh, sort of smack you down a little bit and sort of correct your your path and that's a little bit more the way i see them is that okay mm -hmm. yeah that's great i think you mentioned um online perhaps in that thread that about ethics that um when you take these five month periods you still use ayahuasca is that correct i said that yeah yeah i said that in order to make a kind of a point that um, that I, I guess it probably in order to make a point that um, I'm not it was a point of kind of questioning standard interpretations of third precept. So kind of it was it kind of a joke then, like uh... Uh, well, I mean, I just I'm I'm hesitant to uh, I mean that that is factually true. Uh, it is factually true. I do uh, try to drink ayahuasca from time to time um, in, in the way that I just described. Mm -hmm. But but also, I, you know, with that, we can get into talking about the precepts a little bit right now since it seems to be coming up. I'll just say, that, you know, uh, as far as I've been able to find in the kind of uh, poly canon, Buddha sort of says, don't drink this stuff and don't drink this other stuff. He names two different substances, one of which is a distilled alcohol and one of which is a fermented alcohol. And that's basically what he had to say on the matter. So the kind of evolution of that precept from being a precept for monks not to get drunk to being a kind of blanket prohibition on some substances uh, is to me somewhat problematic uh, because of course within Buddhist centers all over the world, people drink tea like it's going out of style uh, and lots of people smoke cigarettes and they don't even think they're taking a drug. Uh, lots of people drink coffee. You know, I've, I've sat many sessions where people get up and, you know, they got to brew themselves a cup of coffee before they even hit the Zendo at 4.30 in the morning. Um, and to me, those are as worthy of prohibition as ayahuasca. That's what I'm trying to say. I see. 
Yeah, part part of the reason I ask as well is um, you mentioned a, quite a variety of substances that you have a relationship with, as you said, and I'm curious. Um, I mean, some of them are maybe more straightforward than others of like why one might take coffee, for example, or tea. Um, oh, really? It's straightforward. Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, wakefulness and enjoyment, I'd say. Okay. Uh, but, you know, in any case, uh, I'm I'm curious what, how to put it. Um, if, if they're medicine, as you say, what the different medicines are doing for you that you makes you have a relationship with them as, as you would describe it, as you would hold it. Well, as I would, I, what I'm talking about is what I was talking about earlier, Tush, in that I think that um, altering consciousness is interesting in and of itself and a, it could be valuable. I don't say it's valuable for everyone. Um, and I, I wouldn't recommend that um, under my, under my other name, but uh, under the name Hap Savage. Yeah. I would say, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting to alter consciousness. It's interesting even to become habituated to a substance. It's interesting to, for instance, get habituated to caffeine and then uh, to, to get off it again. You, you can really learn a lot about body-mind by doing that. Uh, it's interesting to become habituated to tobacco. Tobacco also has, uh, you know, it's, there's a reason why tobacco is in all the countries in which it grows is universally regarded as the most sacred of plants. If you don't kind of get super addicted to it, a few puffs of good, strong tobacco has an incredible effect on the entire body mind, which means on the entire world, you know, suddenly the world gets a little bit brighter and you sort of tingle all over and your consciousness becomes a little bit more clear and your emotions become a little bit calm. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Um, so the way that we use it under techno capitalism is a terrible blasphemy, and one which I uh, would like to try to work to end, if possible. So that, as an example, as an example of a, a substance which, you know, you might look at it and say it's not obvious. I mean, most people don't think they're taking a drug at all when they smoke tobacco. And then if you do acknowledge it as a drug, you might say, well, it's you, uh, my sort of Buddhist interlocutor, might say, uh, why would you do that? Well, the, the reason is curiosity to sort of see the way that consciousness changes and to become, as I said earlier, intimate with the texture of consciousness. I think that's a really interesting kind of thing to do. Does that help to answer? Very helpful, yes. Um, it, it sounds like it's less like, um, they they serve different functions for you or something and more that you're just like curious to explore what happens when you alter consciousness through really any substance. Yeah, I mean, obviously they serve functions, you know, like I just said, smoking a little tobacco, you know, some if, if my wife and I are having a fight, you know, we'll often kind of just roll up a, a smoke and sit outside the back door and kind of pass it back and forth and smoke it and and all of a sudden we're not really having a fight anymore and we're able to talk about our problems. So that's, you know, it's a, in that sense, in a kind of uh, limited sort of mechanistic sense, it's a medicine. Alcohol, I don't actually really drink very much, uh, but, uh, but I have, I have drank a lot and it's a fantastic, you know, I mean, as, as everybody knows, you know, most children wouldn't have been conceived if not for the drug alcohol you know it's a it's a great kind of social lubricant it's a great kind of erotic medicine cannabis fantastic erotic medicine uh fantastic kind of trance inducing great for creativity you know you can kind of learn about what these different things are kratom i, I write a lot on kratom uh you could you can learn what they are but um that's not really the point from a practice standpoint from a practice standpoint, what's interesting is, um, I mean, my, an old teacher of mine would probably have said what's interesting is what doesn't change. And that's a kind of a good way to look at it, even with something, you know, pretty intense like ayahuasca or salvia divinorum. It's an opportunity to sort of see what doesn't change. 
if you hold this interpretation of the f- the fifth precept where the Buddha said monks shouldn't drink this, these two forms of alcohol, uh, is the basis of drinking it yourself that you're not a monk? Or uh, how do you hold that if, if that's the view of the fifth precept? Uh, my view of the fifth precept is don't become habituated. Mm-hmm. Don't become addicted. And so I actually, when I notice that I'm becoming addicted, and you know the whole question of what does the word addiction mean is a fraught one, and we could dive down that rabbit hole because it actually doesn't have just one definition. Um, but I have my own sort of sense of when I'm becoming addicted to something. And uh, for instance, Twitter. And so I take a day off every week, actually, from Twitter uh, to help me to help me kind of keep that um, hedonic treadmill in check. So that's my personal interpretation of the, of the fifth precept. And that's, you know, we, we argued a lot about how valid it is to kind of come up with your own interpretations of the precepts, which may wander very far from either contemporary understandings or traditional understandings. And um, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll just out myself. I, I, I interpret them in wildly idiosyncratic ways. And I'm, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, no, I, I love that. Um, and that's um, what, what I'm curious about. So, you know, the uh, context of that conversation was to lean into conflict, but in, in truth, in this moment, I'm, I'm just kind of curious to hear about it from you, less, less of a conflict oriented stance and, um, I'd be curious to ask along those lines, like what the genesis of was, what the genesis of the sort of five months a year off was for you, how you started having that practice. Why five months? Uh, you know, why not eight months or one month or a day or, or what, uh, how did you start having that practice? And can you tell me a bit more about it? Yeah. Uh, that actually started because, you know, there's, um, I'm sure you know, there's a kind of tradition in Buddhist uh, monasteries and and Buddhist centers uh, of having a practice period and uh, the origin of which being that at a certain point, historically, monks couldn't just wander and beg for food because there was the monsoon season. And so they would have to settle down and live and have a fixed abode for a while. And during that time, they would spend more time meditating and less time begging. And um, I've always liked that. And I've always kind of followed it, um, you know, for a long time. I've, I've tried to kind of, in the winter, uh, when it's rainy here in California, I kind of try to settle in and, and deepen my practice from wherever it's gotten over the summer. That's, um, that's the, the genesis of it. So, uh, five, you know, it, it comes out to five, five lunations because I have personally, I have a whole like hyper complicated ritual calendar that I follow that has to do with the phases of the moon and the position of the sun and the equinoxes and the, you know, old kind of, I were actually not that old pagan holidays, the invented old pagan holidays, uh, having to do with the position of the sun in the sky. And so that's fun for me um, because I feel a sense of awe at randomness. And uh, so, and it's kind of fun for me also. I, it, it feels good to me to sort of divest um, some of the decision-making to kind of just not have to make a decision, but to be able to look at my calendar and say, well, it's the first new moon after the equinox time to cut out all these damn drugs. And um, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love it. (laughs) I love it. Um, Yeah, I'd be curious to ask as well about uh, the role of sexuality and the erotic. That was the fourth one that you mentioned. And, and, um, you know, certainly I have a sense of this myself, but would be curious to hear you describe it, why that would be part of your spirituality and spiritual practice and what, what what that does for you and how you connect to it. 
So there are two kind of um, aspects to that. One aspect is relates to uh, the third precept and understandings of that, um, because an observation that I have made is that uh, many Buddhists um, aren't honest with themselves about their own sexuality, I would say. Uh, many Buddhist teachers aren't. Many Buddhist students aren't. And many Buddhist students don't really talk to their teachers about what they're really getting up to. And uh, so the overarching kind of sex negativity of Buddhism, and I don't think this is just American Buddhism. I actually think there's something kind of sex negative from the get-go. Um, Vajrayana might be an exception, but I, I don't, I'm not an expert. Uh, I think that that sort of sex negativity leads to a situation in which this vast area of human experience is just not uh, brought into the field of practice. And in my personal life, I, I want to bring it into the field of practice. That feels important to me, and that feels to me like the true import of the third precept is to practice with this force, which, as Dan Savage says, sex is older than we are. And so um, this force is actually more powerful than our ideas about it. And that is shown, you know, I, I don't need to enumerate the number of kind of sex scandals that rock every spiritual community. Um, but they're, they're ubiquitous. And uh, there's a reason for that, which is that sex is powerful. So I want to try to practice with it, not ignore it, because I think ignorance is also ignoring, intentional ignoring is non-Buddhist. So that's one side of it. Another side would be that um, from a kind of, from a tantric perspective, um, We rise by that by which we fall, and uh, there's there's a tantric practice of sort of taking whatever is forbidden and uh, and working with it. Um, and there's even a kind of uh, you know there's even a kind of sort of sexual practice you can do where. Uh, you're sort of uh, embodying divine powers, if you like. I mean, this is all kind of woo, but it works, and uh, it's worth exploring for those who are interested in, in exploring it. Uh, I think if you're drawn in that direction, I think um, one of the ways you can kind of bring your own sexual life into the nirvana gate into the field of practice is to actively kind of explore some of these ideas of embodying archetypes, um, uh, what kind of trance states can come about in sexuality, uh, what it is to worship your partner as a deity, what it is to be worshiped. And from that, even, you know, things like power exchange, uh, I think, can be profoundly spiritual. And, and I, I think they, they are for a lot of people that are involved in kink communities, um, DS communities. I think a lot of people would say that their experiences there are quote unquote spiritual. And I think there's a reason why they would say that. Um, so I think those are ways in which the erotic can be, um, can be really a spiritual practice and, and a way for people. And it, it can be a way for people who want to still be Buddhist, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I want to come back to the Buddhism from this perspective of, uh, it sounds like you had a clear sense at a certain point, you know, maybe over time or maybe at a specific moment, but in any case that you wanted to integrate these three other aspects of life into your own spiritual practice. Uh, you know, of nature, psychedelics, and sexuality. Um, 
but there's also the Buddhism. And I, we touched on this, of course, to some extent, but I, I'd be curious to hear you describe like what you find beautiful about Buddhism or resonant about Buddhism and, and what that, what that holds for you. Oh, well, that's true. I mean, that's, we, we can spend a hundred hours talking about that, but um, gosh, like I said, there's, there's not really anything I don't find resonant, but okay. Uh, like really primarily what is Buddhism? What is Buddhist doctrine and how is it different from what would now be thought of as a Hindu doctrine? How is it, what's it, why is it different? It's different because instead of saying pedagogically that the point of spiritual practice is to separate the self, the principle of pure awareness from everything in the world, including the limited self, instead of saying that the point is to separate it out and then realize that it is uh, infinitely free and unbounded and blissful. Or on the other hand, instead of saying that the point of spiritual practice is to clarify the principle of pure consciousness and to realize its identity with the divine, Instead of either of those pedagogical routes, Buddhism starts by saying, what if there is no principle of pure consciousness? What if there is no self? So that, I, in that sense, I am very much a Buddhist because that's really helpful for me. I don't say those, I, I think the differences among those views are pedagogical and not, um, different, not, not actually ontological, as uh, our mutual friend would say. But, um, but I do think that from a pedagogical standpoint, starting from a position of anatman, of no self, is a pretty good place to start. And it has been for me and continues to be for me. So that's something about Buddhism I really cherish. What else do I cherish? I cherish... I cherish the commitment to ethical principles as, as I say, idiosyncratic as my own commitments may be. Uh, I feel like that is something that's missing from a lot of kind of contemporary spiritual paths, as well as something that's missing from a lot of kind of uh, McMindfulness sort of popularizations. And I think there's something that's really essential. I think without uh, containers, it's really hard to do spiritual practice. So I love uh, the I love the overarching view that I mean this is my understanding. Okay, not not everybody understands it this way, but but my understanding of the four noble truths is. Uh, Everything is suffering. Cause of suffering is thirst. There is an end to thirst, and that's nirvana or extinguishment. And that extinguishment or nirvana is process, which never ends. And that process is also the Eightfold Path. It can be enumerated in an entire lifestyle which you can continue doing for your entire life. And that is actually um, the continuing process of ending suffering. Uh, that, I, there's just no better kind of statement for me that's a helpful ground for my own life. So um, I'm also personally, you know, really committed to the Zen tradition, to the Soto Zen tradition. And what does that mean? That means seated meditation plus temple cleaning. Uh, so I try to keep doing those things because I find them beautiful and because I find them uh, instructive 
and an expression of whatever insight I've been granted. Mm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Can you speak to um, why the view of Anatman would be pedagogically useful? Yeah, I think it's pedagogically useful because I think there is a subtle trap that lies in store for those who start from a sense of of, of soul or because um, we use self to mean a bunch of different things, but Atman, uh, you know, kind of means something more like what we would call in English soul. Um, and, and I think that there's, there's a very subtle trap that lies in wait for those who begin from that sense, because uh, what happens is you, you can, you can, you can work your, your way into a kind of a cul-de-sac of more and more subtle sense of separation between self and other uh, until eventually you're, you know, you're, it, it, it's, it's very, very subtle, but you've kind of poked your way deep into a, a hole from which it's very difficult to get out where you sort of feel like, you know, you're some kind of a witness or you're sort of, you, you sort of have a self, but it's vast and silent and just observing everything, but still there an everything that's being observed and there's a self that, or it's like a mirror, you know, it's like a mirror you're keeping clean. And um, I, I have seen many people um, get, get to that kind of a point where they're, they, they have a, um, a sense of, where they, they've, they've sort of clarified their selves uh, to, the, to, the, to the point, to this great point where they're sort of very, very clear and bright, but they're also deeply, deeply separated from the rest of the world. And it's not good. It's not good. It's a dark, um, actually a, a very dark, painful place to be. And unless you have a teacher who can carefully kind of guide you and keep you from getting stuck in those kind of cul-de-sacs, cul-de-sac, um, I actually think pedagogically it's better just to strike the head from the beginning, as my old teacher used to say, and just start from the assumption that there is no such thing as a sense of self. And whatever that might mean that at first it's it's incomprehensible or it just seems like words, but still you're kind of starting from uh, you're not starting from a subtle dualism, and uh, I, I think it's danger. I think there's a real danger if you start from a very subtle dualism of just making the dualism more and more subtle, but not actually kind of um, being able to understand things non-dualistically, which which also you know produces a situation in which uh, you, uh, you're, there's a kind of selfishness to that practice. So, you know, I, th I, I think Buddhism has a, a good medicine encased in it that keeps us aware that our practice is not for us, but actually is for all sentient and non-sentient beings. Yeah, that's helpful. Um... Let's dive into ethics a bit more. And, um, and it's interesting that you hold such value in ethics and the Buddhist ethics, and also at the same time, do hold them in your own idiosyncratic way that we've, you know, discussed various fine points of, but can you, can you talk about that? And um, uh, those two sides of like, having ethical guidelines, caring about ethics, caring about the training of ethics of Sila and at the same time, wanting to find your own, your own sense of ethics, your own interpretation of the precepts that have been handed down that resonates for you. Um, is there a tension there? Like, where do those two sides come from? How do you hold the Buddhist ethics such that you would interpret them on your own? Um, does, does that make sense? It makes total sense. It makes total sense. Um, no, there's no tension there, and uh, and 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 
I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not play fighting with you, but I'm going to say that that kind of statement, that kind of attitude really chaps my hide because everybody's interpreting, you know, even if you're, no matter who you are at, at the very beginning, as a very beginning student, you're interpreting and your teachers are interpreting and their teachers were interpreting. And, you know, the, the precepts in their wording, as we're given them in English, are open to immense amounts of interpretation. And there are millions of kind of edges and corner cases that they don't cover that you'll encounter from the very beginning of practice, um, from the very beginning of trying to understand them. So the idea that uh, somehow we should not interpret, uh, I think, is just incoherent, frankly, um, because I think everybody's trying to, everybody has to interpret. Uh, and that's the whole point for me. One of the main points of kind of, you know, taking ethical vows is then there are Dharma gates that open up and those Dharma gates are questions. Those Dharma gates are questions. Have I broken this vow that I made? Am I about to break this vow that I made? And refusing to kind of uh, entertain those questions is refusing to enter those Dharma gates. And when we take the Bodhisattva vow, we vow to actually to enter every single Dharma gate that presents itself to us. So uh, I think that's, I think you're a bad Buddhist if you don't entertain those kind of questions. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, no, I, 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 that makes a lot of sense that there would not be tension and it would come from genuinely wrestling with the ethical questions for oneself. Um, is that a fair characterization of what you're describing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me ask as well about, um, you know, you described earlier, you described Hap Savage as sort of a personality. Did I, did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Um, what, what is the, who is the person that is not Hap Savage and who is the personality of Hap Savage and how do you relate to those two people or hold them or explore them? Uh, well, in this context, uh, the person that is not Hap Savage, um, for a variety of funny kind of contingent reasons, uh, just has a, a more of a sense of responsibility to, uh, I, I, uh, under that other name, I have more of a sense of responsibility to my Buddhist community. Mm -hmm. and my Buddhist teachers and my last teacher who died a few years ago was very reverent and was at times in trouble with his the institution that he was part of. But even so, uh, if I felt I was representing his Dharma, if I felt I was entrusted with his Dharma, I, uh, I would be careful, more careful, uh, to, to say, to say less, I would be careful to say less. I, in, in a way, I would be careful um, not to say, not, not to give guidance. Uh, in a way, I would be more careful to, you know, let the goose get out of the bottle on its own. Does that make sense? You know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, as Hap Savage, I can kind of just blab and, um, and, and state my kind of stupid opinions or my brilliant, I can, I'm free to be poetic and, to know lots of things and kind of um, say say all the things that I know and be fascinating and it's not dangerous to be fascinating because nobody's going to be led astray by me because who would be led astray by um, a ridiculous stranger that they encountered on the internet? So uh, is that <laughs> does that does that kind of answer the question? Yes, it does. So uh, there's sort of a, a more reserved traditional Buddhist person. And there's also like this freewheeling, playful, exploratory, half savage character. Yeah, yeah, and partly the freedom of sort of being a pseudonymous character on the internet is that um, uh, also I, I'm free at least to hope that no one will take me seriously. I mean, in our little fake fight that we had about um, my my precept post. Partly, it seemed that you were pushing me on um, potentially saying things that might mislead people. 
And I was pushing back saying, who cares? I'm just a stranger on the internet. How could I mislead anybody? And I, it was a pretty good critique, actually. I know you were leaning into it a little bit, but uh, it made me think. It made me think like, gosh, what if somebody did encounter this and, you know, imagine that there was a reason to pay attention to me and imagine that, that I, you know, was, was saying something sensible. Um, it's possible that someone could be led astray by that. And maybe I do need to be a tiny bit more careful. I haven't done it, but, um, <laughs> but, but at least I, I do have the question uh, in mind, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe I need to make an alt account and, and, uh, <laughs> be, be even weirder there. I, uh, it, it is a real question, but, but basically what I'm, I'm resting on is the idea that, uh, under this persona, I can be presumed to be um, a nobody, and therefore, um, and therefore, I'm free to kind of uh, be, be uh, not not just to be antinomian, you know, or or sexy or spicy, but also free to be profound. Um, I, I would be more careful about being profound, frankly. Because I think it's dangerous to be profound if there's, if people are looking up to you as some kind of a teacher. Um, I've experienced that, being being too profound, being too smart, being too poetic. Uh, it is really easy for people to start to project things onto you, and uh, and in that way, they harm themselves and they harm you too. So. It's interesting that you say that because that um, HAP sort of frees you from sort of a kind of responsibility where people might not take you too seriously because I think this conversation is helping me arrive at some clarity about why I've been drawn to the things that I've seen you say because, um, you know, we've sort of circled around these four elements of your spiritual practice of, yes, there's this strong foundation of practice, Buddhism before that, Advaita, but also, um, you know, this call to nature, psychedelics and other drugs and substances, and then also sexuality. And I think um, maybe to a lesser extent, I mean, uh, I think I've sort of done the work to, to some extent, there's always more to do, of course, but to integrate nature into the Buddhism, but the, the elements of sexuality and, and psychedelics and drugs haven't been completely integrated, I'd say. And, um, you know, so, and sort of this, this whole, um, lightness of Hap Savage of playfulness and exploration and, um, being freewheeling and, and playful in the ways that I see you be playful aren't things that I had, uh, necessarily integrated for myself from my own Buddhist background. And so seeing someone that is exploring these dimensions in their life and also their expressions um, sort of did make me and does make me take what you say seriously as hap, right? Um, not not in a way that I would view you as like, oh, you're my teacher or something like that. I don't, I don't hold you that way. I, view you as like a, a peer, a Dharma peer, maybe a senior. We, we talked about this as well. You're like, oh, seniors, horseshit or something. But, um, but you know, that's actually how I hold it is that you've been around for a while. And so I should, I, I do, I just do look up to you and, and, and value what you say, not as um, you're better than me or something, but you have had more experiences than I have uh, been around a while, you know? Um, and so as I try to integrate these things in a wholesome and, ethical way. Uh, it's, it's nice to have someone talking about these things instead of, you know, as, as you're saying earlier, repressing them and avo or avoiding them or, you know, shunning them or something like that. It's like, Hey, I, I have sex and I like it and I do these drugs and I like it and I try to hold it in a way that seems to me to be ethical. Like that's really interesting. And, um, something that I've wanted to hear. And I, I think the answers that I've arrived at for myself, are different, but that's the nature of the game as you're talking about to like really wrestle with it for oneself. And so uh, I, I guess it's interesting to summarize. It's interesting to hear you say, hey, I'm not going to be taken seriously as Hap because uh, I mean, frankly, I'd probably take ha this Hap character more seriously than, you know, a Soto Zen dude that I just bumped into on on a session or something. 
it, that that is interesting, but it's a different kind of serious. I mean, because mm-hmm. you it, it is possible, like you do see me as uh, as a friend, as a Dharma friend, and mm-hmm. and it's like that's really what I want is I do want to kind of model uh, maybe that 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 hey, it is possible to uh, be frank about some of these topics uh, and still at least try to be a good Buddhist student, you know, not necessarily a successful Buddhist, but at least a good student. And uh, I, I strongly believe that the world needs less, fewer Buddhist, bad Buddhist teachers and more good Buddhist students. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. That is so beautiful. Uh, I love it. I love it. Huh. Mm. Is there anything that uh, feels alive for you that's adjacent to the different topics that we've talked about that you'd like to share more about or talk more about? Uh, let's see. Um, well, I am curious to ask you about how your kind of integration, if we're going to kind of stick with these sort of four elements of practice as a potential enumeration. I, I am curious to hear something about how your integration uh, has gone, if you want to share. Sure, certainly, certainly. Um, well, let's see. Maybe starting think... with nature, just starting with nature, because uh, you mentioned that you feel like you've already done that work. So how, how's that for you? Well, I think um, nature was very close to the Buddhist teachings that I received from my teacher, Saryu. Um, I think his connection to nature was primary in his own path and maybe the motivating reason for why he sought out Buddhism and meditation. It was basically to protect animals and the planet from the human mind. And that's something that he talks extensively about. And so it was just very much woven into the teachings that I received there was this is for caring for the planet. Um, This isn't about your own stress reduction or something. This is about not that he ever put it this way, but what comes to me in this moment is like humans doing our part to make up for all the shit we've done to the planet. Uh, I never heard him put it that way, but that feels alive for me. And at least in this moment is like, we've got a tab with the planet, you know? Uh, So it it was just always in my consciousness training with him. And then I'd say, especially um, in the last couple of years, that became my own. I would say my own connection to nature was never especially present for me. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs and I didn't have the same motivation that he did. But, um, you know, I did extensive solitary retreat last year in the woods in Vermont and also did some pilgrimages at some point. And you know, really reconnected with nature in that way myself. And then also, also, um, I, yeah, I think that was my own direct experience. And then I think, um, in the last six months or so as well, reading the overstory, have you read that? No. Oh, it's tremendous. It's tremendous. It's this excellent novel that's about humanity's relationships with relationship with trees, uh, which, you know, it's been incredibly acclaimed as, as a, as a book. And, I think that that book sort of solidified intellectually and emotionally a lot of the intuitive embodied realizations that I came to myself through extensive solitary retreat in in the woods in Vermont. Um, Yeah. So I I guess I'd say at multiple levels, it's just been baked into the the teachings that I've been exposed to in a way that I suspect is unique for, for most Buddhists. Um, but that's just been in the water for me. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I, I guess I can take them one by one. So, um, let's see. The second one was, uh, oh gosh, I'm forgetting now. Um, I think think drugs. it It was nature and then drugs, right? Yes. Um, well, it's, it's interesting. It's sort of similar to what you said of, uh, like I did them in, I did drugs extensively in when I was a teenager and in my early adulthood and mostly out of curiosity, although I'd, I'd say that sort of pushed me in the direction of looking for something like a spiritual practice of like basically realizing, um, I think, I think drugs at that time taught me two things. One was I can't trust adults. <laughs> 
because I had been told, you know, these things are going to kill you and they're going to be terrible for you. And then I did my research and I was like, these are not going to kill you. They're not, you know, just like evil incarnate or something. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but that was kind of the message I had received. Um, and so I was like, oh, I, I, can't, I, I can't trust adults. They've lied to me and, and told me f- falsehoods or simplistic things. Uh, what else have they lied about <laughs> if they've told me this? Um, and uh, and I think in that way, really qu- questioning the, how shall we say, the received concept of what life is and what the role of becoming a person is of like, this is our society is just not trustworthy. And I, I don't know what is trustworthy, but like, you know, getting a job and having a family and a house and an insurance and a retirement is like just a huge fiction that I, I don't want to buy into. Um, I'm still not buying into. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's that. And then also, yeah, that altered states of consciousness are possible, that there's not just this one waking consciousness or sleeping consciousness. There's just a lot out there and uh, that that's a territory to explore. I think those are primarily the two things that drugs taught me at the time. And then um, really set them aside when I started meditating and of course later in monastic practice. But I'd say that in recent months, really, last six or so months, um, and this is sort of hand-waving some things, but in my own sanghas, there's been more and more people that are saying, uh, you know, people that I really trust, really respect. I think they have their ethics together. There are a lot of people that do spiritual practice that I don't think have their ethics together uh, in a way that I at least can respect. But people who I really respect saying, hey, there's this is not how they would put it, but there's an altered way that you can hold the fifth precept where uh, you can use substances in a way that's wholesome and beneficial and supportive to spiritual practice, supportive to emotional healing, trauma resolution. And it's not just engaging in addiction or heedlessness, but that these things can have true benefit. And um, so I, I think I've been, after wrestling with it, I've come to my own uh, interpretation, which is basically, yeah, I don't want to get addicted. And I also think heedlessness is extremely important. I think certain substances do cultivate heedlessness in a way that and I haven't heard too many people mention this or, or maybe anyone, but the point of that, at least for me is, Hey, we're doing all this work to cultivate mindfulness, sati, shmriti, remembering, and these substances go in the opposite direction of that, where you're cultivating the, the opposite thing, mindlessness, heedlessness. And so if you're going to put all this effort to becoming more mindful, more aware, you're just going in the opposite direction. And, you know, those substances don't really speak to me. Um, I'm, I don't have interest in, in marijuana or alcohol at this time. Um, you know, maybe they, they do things for other people, but for me, it's like, I I just, I'm not interested. Um, but there have been other substances that I've used that, uh, in in the last months that, uh, I feel have been incredibly supportive to my own practice and my own coming into kind of my own sense of a spirituality. That's not something that I've received, but is my own. And, um, and in fact, I'd say, um, it, it, it surprised me because I was, I think I was in partially largely for for like emotional trauma healing types work um which you know i've done a lot of work with different uh, contemporary psychotherapeutic methods in recent years and i was like oh this would be a way to continue that momentum but the substances that i've engaged with in recent months um they they've served a function that seems un- that, that surprised me that i didn't expect which is not so much about trauma healing but um, and, and not so much like, oh, I'm getting deep, like it's not like, oh, I awakened from them or something, but more about um, activating what I describe as essentially like a messenger function of certain, c- certain relative psychological, spiritual insights come to me about who we are at this time in this planet where it's like, oh, I have this insight of who I am and who other people are and how we should live at this time that I feel a uh, sort of a, a burden being placed on me, uh, a weight to, to express and articulate in a way that I can communicate to the world. That's about how, how we should live at this time and, and not so much like a transcendent awakening or something, but, but Hey, this is how we as humans need to live at this time. And not, not, it's almost like, like, like prophecy. Um, not, not that like I'm some big, special person or something, but there, there is a message to be articulated and this body mind, these skills can articulate them. So, um, I didn't expect that. And, um, 
it's like channeling or something like a channeling a deep wisdom that's not from my relative mind, but from a deeper intuitive mind uh, that is not that is both for me and but also for the people that are connected to me. Um, yeah, so basically, I'm trying to avoid addiction and heedlessness and then really have been trying to step into living and expressing the insights that have come to me f- for the benefit of ideally all beings. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, um, I'll just quickly, I, I don't know if you know this quote from Dennis McKenna, but uh, he, he kind of famously said one time that the basic message of ayahuasca is you monkeys only think you know what's going on. And that sounds a little bit like what you're kind of maybe contacting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I'm still squarely on the on the monkey side of things, but um, I haven't I haven't engage with ayahuasca yet, but, but, but certainly, um, coming into right relationship with being a monkey, <laughs> shall we say? Yeah. is is definitely what it's about. Um, at, at this time at, on the planet for this, for this culture, it's a strange time, but we find ourselves in, and there's not, um, I don't know. And then this is something that I felt as well as attention in Buddhism of, um, not so much in the teachings that I received from my teacher, but more just when I read the Pali Canon, for example, of um, it doesn't speak to what you do about global warming or about capitalism or any of the variety of problems that were that that I feel are quite painful to experience, both for myself and to see others suffering from. And um, you know, saying, "Hey, don't kill beings," for example, I think that's great. I, I love and honor the first precept, but but it's in, radically insufficient for. Uh, the problems that we're invoking on ourselves and the planet. Um, and so really feeling this acute need to discover what, how, how do we live in right relationship in this society at this time on this planet that we're hurting, you know? Um, yeah. So that, that's sort of the third, the, the resolution with the, with the fifth precept for me is, is don't, don't get addicted. Don't cultivate heedlessness, but respect these substances as, something that can be supportive to spiritual practice if, if held in a wholesome way. Great. Well, are you ready to talk about kind of incorporating sexuality into your practice? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I I think this is in, in large part, one of multiple, I think it was a major, not the soul, but a major reason that I ended up leaving monastic training this time around because I did two stints of monastic training but um, I, I think it's a little bit different than the way you were describing it. But in the Pali Canon, they're quite clear that monks shouldn't have sex. And I think there is sex negativity to that. But I also saw, um, saw the value in that of setting aside relationships, setting aside sexuality to focus on practice and seeing, I, I think for me, to engage in a right way with truly monastic practice would require celibacy and abstinence for me to be an integrity and seeing that at the same time, like I am a sexual person, I am a sexual being, I enjoy sex. That ain't happening. (laughs) As a friend of mine said, God didn't make this one that way. (laughs) So I'm a very, very, very sexual person and I love sex and it's delightful for me. And I think it would be good for at least for me, if I was to, to fully engage with monastic training to set that aside, to focus exclusively on practice, but that I wasn't willing to do that, that I wanted to continue to engage with sexuality and explore it. So, so that's a part of it is just knowing myself and seeing that that wasn't who I am or how I wanted to live my life. Um, but also similarly, and maybe this is related of uh seeing, yeah, it is extremely powerful, which is why it's important to treat it ethically. I have actually been developing quite recently a list of rules that I have for myself about how to healthily engage in sexuality. It's a long, a long list, but it's not uh, prohibitive of sex ever happening. (laughs) It's just restrictive. Um, But uh, so it's extremely powerful and I want to use it well. I think, in fact, I think even in spiritual communities, it can be underrated sort of how powerful sexuality is. I think it's far more powerful, certainly than contemporary society tends to discuss, but even within spiritual communities, I think it's sex is far more powerful than we tend to discuss. 
Um, so I want to hold it in a wholesome way, hold it ethically, not hurt people, third precept. Um, but in circumstances where uh, I am expressing that part of myself, where I am embodying being a sexual being, because it's so powerful, it can be spiritually powerful in my experience. So there are things I've learned about how to breathe or relax or move energy through my body or how to be present with someone else that came to me from engaging in sex in these ways that I did not learn through Zazen or sitting. I could bring into the sitting meditation. That was extremely powerful, sort of cross applying those insights, but they did not come to me from the sitting practice itself. Of course, the sitting practice helps in the other direction as well, but um, yeah, but, but, but basically seeing that real spiritual progress can be made through sexuality if, if it's treated in a wholesome way with, with trustworthy people. You know, that's a big part of the rules that I have is like, do I trust this person? Are they also themselves holding ethics in a good way? Um, so, yeah, I think basically because it's so powerful, it needs to be treated with respect very carefully, far more carefully than I see most people holding it. And also, um, if you do treat it with that respect with someone else who does treat it with equal respect, it can be extremely powerful and beneficial because you're treating it with that respect. So that's that's sort of how I've integrated it. Of um, yeah, the, and that that that's that work. A lot of that work has been done and integrated internally for quite a while but then a lot of the recent progress has been you know sort of leaving the monastery to live a life that is in integrity and then also importantly in talking about it as you said i think it's really important to be honest and to share these truths and that's that's why i'm willing to talk about this now um but that that was that would have been hard for me a little while ago to talk honestly about sexuality and uh you know publicly and be like hey just even to say or acknowledge or hint at hey i'm a sexual person i like sex it's fun. It's great. You know, like that, that would have been hard even three months ago. So, um, talking about it has been important as well. Well, uh, perhaps a strange coincidence, but, <laughs> but uh, I guess you're just walking into the room. <laughs> my, my wife and partner. Um, yeah. Uh, consort. And consort. Yeah. Like ultra consort. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, the fourth person in the room, our audience will be happy to know that I've persuaded Booty Embryo Safi to come on herself in the future. So we can look forward to that as well. But so happy you're you're here for this episode, especially at this timing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it feels like an appropriate time. I, I super vibe with what you're saying, Tashin. And um, th there was one thing that kind of occurred to me when you were talking about how your early experiences with drug taking made you realize that grownups were full of shit is I do feel like that's one of the kind of messages that uh, the kind of sex negativity and even drug negativity of mainstream Buddhist centers uh, does kind of send people a little bit the sense that the, that their Buddhist teachers might be full of shit. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think there's a real danger. I think there's kind of a, a, a weak foundation uh, a little bit there, a teetering foundation, because I I don't know how many people I've seen either breeze into Buddha. I mean, of course, Buddha centers are hotbeds. Uh, everybody's fucking <laughs> everybody, and yeah. uh, and, and, and <laughs> you know the sh shoes are outside the wrong doors all over the place, and everybody knows it. <laughs> um, and yet, it's like it's. If it's talked about, it's talked about with this very kind of fake, stern, puritanical kind of gaze from from teachers who are frankly always, you know, much, much older than their students and who always give advice, uh, which is, you know, to be, if you can't be celibate, be monogamous, which is um, maybe workable advice when you're 65, maybe. But it's pretty tough when you're 25 to kind of have that be reasonable advice. And 25-year-old Zen Buddhist students all, all know that. And they all sort of just laugh it off. And, and, uh, and I've, seen, I've also seen lots of people who are um, 
just promiscuous, you know, who kind of just have a promiscuous lifestyle, either because they're poly or they're just plain horny. Um, you know, a lot of my gay male friends who come into Zen centers and kind of realize that they're not, their teachers don't understand what their lives are like. They, they really are talking to them from, the, from a cultural perspective that doesn't make any sense. And these people just kind of leave. They kind of leave and they give up on the whole kind of, they, they throw out the baby of Buddhism with the bathwater because they can tell that somebody's, you know, talking about stuff they don't really understand. You know, it's, it's to, I, I do take a certain amount of, I'm not sure that the idea that um, sex is a distraction from spiritual practice is ever true for anybody, though I totally respect that you have that view. And I know lots of people do, uh, but I just want to put that a little bit in question. I'm, I'm really not sure that, um, that something so basic could ever be regarded as a distraction, though I know it's in the poly canon. Um, mm. Yeah, those are my thoughts on what you were just saying. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I came to see that for myself because there was so much, especially in the monastic environment, so much emphasis on uh, maintaining a technique 24-7 all day, all day long. And that the more I really tried to do that, the more challenging I saw that that was like, e even like using the computer, I mean, just possible, extremely hard. Um, so engaging with relationships where emotions come up or, you know, difficult, high interpersonal challenge level. Um, and, and I trust me, I tried to do both, but like 24 seven mindfulness, deep going in the direction of classical enlightenment by way of Samadhi and relationships, you know, in the monastic container that's supposed to be dedicated to that intensity of spiritual practice. For myself, it was like I, I can't, I can't do both of these things, uh, at least in this lifetime. <laughs> so uh, it's less of like it, for me, it's very much about me and my own knowledge of myself and my own aspirations spiritually, rather than like a, a blanket. The Pali Canon is right, sort of thing. So, yeah. so Tashin, do you believe in enlightenment? Oh man, we opened that can of worms, didn't we? Um, Yes. And I think I have multiple competing models for what enlightenment is that don't add up in my head. Uh, it's a very confusing topic to me. Uh, in some of those models, like everyone's enlightened, so I'm enlightened. Or, you know, in other models, I've, you know, well, let me see how to word this carefully. You can squint at experiences I've had and I mean, really squint and someone else of different integrity could say words that argued that I was enlightened from those squinty experiences. I, I'm not claiming to be enlightened. In fact, I would much prefer to say, well, I'd prefer not to talk about it. And, <laughs> and, and failing that, since we are talking about it, I'd say, no, definitely not enlightened by my own standards of whatever that would mean. But um, yeah, basically, it's very confusing to me. And I think that there's something real there that I don't understand and have not seen for myself. Yes. Okay. Well, that's an honest answer and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you believe in enlightenment? No, I think it's a huge, I think it's a toy to, uh, to confuse children. <laughs> and uh, I think taken any more seriously than that, it's a toxic mistake. Wow. You have to say a little bit more, Hap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, and can I add a question? Like, like so, so funneled through Euro-Western society and like dualistic ideas about sort of achievement and attainment and, and false notions of stasis? Or do you, or even let's say like, well, I don't know, we can't contextually know what enlightenment would have been well we but, can we can we can do a little bit towards that because yeah. i do think when i'm what i'm critiquing is uh the the word enlightenment itself in english which 
you know, there's a there's a historical contingency there where that word was chosen by this person called Max Muller to translate the Sanskrit moksha because he actually was a fan of Kant and wanted to kind of prove that the Rig Veda was uh, like somehow a, a primordial Ur-Kantianism or Ur-Enlightenment. So he was actually trying to make a uh, uh, philosophical and historical argument with it. And then that word, because it's floating around, kind of began to be used to translate all these other words, many of which have different meanings uh, in their spiritual context. So it's used to translate words like Satori and Kensho and, um, and Fusheng and uh, others as well. Uh, and um, so, so that's what I, I'm critiquing the kind of cultural notion that's abroad in my American society when I critique that. Yes, thank you. Do you, how do you hold uh, awakening or nirvana or whatever you would like to call it outside of the Western frame that you're criticizing? Uh, two things. One thing is I think that there, there are things that happen on the path of practice and those things are, are real. There are changes that occur, but I think the idea is Woody saying that those changes lead to some kind of cataclysmic are, are, are like sort of cataclysmic and you can never go back from them. And I mean, there's a way where there are changes that happen that you can never go back from. Um, but the, I, I think the idea that's abroad is that, uh, certain people have it and other people don't, and it's one specific thing and it's a kind of stasis. And I think that's a really dangerous idea. So, um, while I do acknowledge that all kinds of events occur on the path, uh, some of which changes forever, others of which, you know, there are other times where we sort of, the, the, the analogy is that you are walking through the mist and suddenly you realize that your robes are completely soaked, but there never was a downpour. Um, that kind of thing happens to people too. But all for me in the context of an ongoing and eternal process of opening, which for me is best expressed in Dogen's use of the two characters uh, practice and realization as one thing. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's how I see it. And, and it, it's kind of a, a high horse that I get on because I do feel that in the, in the absence of the notion of there being some kind of goal of spiritual practice, which is like a transformation into some sort of magical being who can read people's minds and is hyper present or something. I mean, partly people don't talk a lot about what they mean by enlightenment. And so people are operating with different internal definitions and because it's kind of a taboo to even talk about people, you know, uh, they don't really get straight on what it is that they, they mean by it. But imagining that it's something like that, uh, in the absence of that notion, it would be possible to imagine spiritual practice more like what you said your teacher did, that it's, it's for the, the point of it is just to be kind of a good community member. And that could be enough. You know what I mean? Like it could be enough to just sort of be like, yeah, I practice because it makes me more compassionate and curious and a better person to be around and that's good enough and there's no kind of goal or kind of final transformation and i feel like the soteriological you know or, or, or teleological kind of idea that there's a, a some sort of cataclysmic transformation which you're working towards um makes it a little uh, harder to be a good person. That's what I really think. 
or maybe it shouldn't, but I feel like I observe that in the people that seem to, uh, to not have been able to like divorce extreme, like sort of ego attachment from the idea of cataclysmic change. Yeah, I would, I would say that seems to be true to me. Yeah. Like what were we talking about the other day? I can't remember who said this. If you said it or so I saw someone else say it on Twitter, but something like, like, uh, yeah, 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 you're enlightened. How's your relationship with your mother? How's your relationship with your community? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. oh, you have special powers? Well, what is your day-to-day -day life like? Yeah, and that's like in why... relationship to others, I mean specifically. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's my understanding of Dogen is like Dogen used two characters, one of which means practice and the other of which means like proof. Mm -hmm. uh, or it's in contemporary Chinese is like a certificate. And so what he was saying is like the proof of practice is the practice itself. And they're, they're never separate. And part of that practice is like practicing with a community and with other people. And like, how do you actually interface with, you know, interpersonal dynamics? And, um, and it's not, it's, it's not your ability to kind of like you're saying, Tashin, your ability to kind of remain bodyful or mindful in uh, the face of uprising of 10,000 things is both a is both a practice and a proof that you're doing the practice that's my understanding of dogen which for me is is helpful and more beautiful than the idea that there could be some kind of transformation which would suddenly make it all easy hmm. Hmm. that makes sense I'd, I'd like to come back to one final question maybe which is uh let me think how to put this it's about, you said earlier that the the world needs less bad Buddhist teachers and more good Buddhist students. Um, I guess that and our conversation overall, including the part where we touched on like the relationship that you and I have, and I think the relationship I have with Buddha as well, is um, I would say one of peers, you know, uh, I look up to both of you, but I also see you as peers, not not as my teachers. Peers, um, I for myself right now, I'm not looking for teachers actually, and I'm also not looking for students. I will share things with people, like I teach meta every week, but that's more like, hey, there's this technique that I really like that I think is good for the world. Happy to share it with people. It's more like a sharing or a, a guiding than a than the way that I have held a teacher student relationship previously on on both ends of those roles, um, which is much more formal and I think serious, uh, for a variety of reasons. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of just disinterested in that dynamic either way. I'd, I much prefer peer relationships. And so I'd be curious to hear even both of you describe, uh, you know, how, how you currently hold the teacher student dynamic or, you know, the peer dynamic and, and where, where you're at with that, what, uh, you know, hearing my report of where I'm at, that I'm, I'm sort of disinterested in being a teacher, disinterested in being a student to a teacher, more interested in, in peer relationships. Um, what that brings up for you about that. Should I go first? Yeah. Um, I'm, I also am kind of, I, I lost my last teacher to death uh, some years ago. And uh, since then I haven't had a formal uh, relationship to a teacher. So I'm, I'm open to it and I'm kind of, I like having a teacher. I like, but my last teacher also was, uh, definitely a peer. Um, we would do formal dialogue sometimes, but, uh, but definitely mostly we got a bottle of wine together and, uh, and just talked shit. Um, and violated the fifth precept together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say that teacher was a, did you talk about that teacher at all? Only very, I re referenced him just a little. Yeah. Was a, I feel like a 
kind of going back to, sorry to interrupt, but kind yeah. of going back to the talk, like talking about sort of um, sex in like Buddhist communities to me is kind of an outlier and really good teacher in his, well, this is, so I'm coming in here as a, someone who has like, uh, I want to say, I, um, I'm on a, I'm on a path that doesn't have these precepts. So easy for me to say, but I thought he was a delightful precept breaker. But you could, <laughs> yeah. No. yeah. I mean, he was very frank, uh, and that was good. That yes. Was, yeah, yeah, was, he was a good teacher for me because he was very frank. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I would say like, obviously you all started, there's a care, more careful conversation to have a, about what all of that would mean and how one might walk that razor's edge. And yeah. Yeah. We touched on that a little bit. Yeah. Cool. But I mean, I, in, in the, in the bigger kind of response to what you're saying, Tashin, I feel like, um, like being a, like a teacher student relationship, uh, it can be really beautiful. And I often say that it's like two poles of a battery and you need to have both poles of the battery for the current to flow. And somebody needs to take the teacher's seat in order for the student to be able to have student experiences. And my personal experience um, as a student, you get to have experiences of insight where you suddenly like you suddenly understand things. And maybe even I mean, for my root teacher, often uh, long after he died, I would suddenly real. I would remember something he said. He said to me a thousand times and I would suddenly be like, oh, my God, he actually meant it. He just meant exactly what he was saying. And now I get it. Um and it's great to have those experiences. And as a teacher, you get to have experiences of really broad, uh, total acceptance of another human being, which is also really good for your practice. Um, so I think those things are really good. Uh, and sometimes it, it seems to me that people are rushing so fast to become, maybe because of the attention economy, People are rushing so fast to kind of hang out a shingle. I mean, also because of pure economic incentives, because we live, we haven't talked about this very much, but we live in a country in which there's no tradition of kind of uh, Buddhism. And so if you become a Buddhist priest, you don't actually get any money from a bunch of tithing peasants uh, and you don't chant sutras for the dead for anybody. And so there's, how are you going to make money? Well, you got to teach Buddhism. That's what you got to do. Uh, so there's there's a perverse incentive to kind of become a teacher in some way, which I, I think is kind of too bad. I think, you know, relationships like these, like the ones that we have of sort of being students together um, are really beautiful and, and productive. And, and Sangha is more about that than it is about um, a teacher student relationship, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, the person I would call my teacher now is from um, somatics, though I've had people I will, maybe still would call my teachers, but teachers sort of of different things, uh, meaning of like certain approaches to yoga or of, or I have a Sanskrit teacher. Anyway, but the person I really call my teacher is kind of like a mentor in somatics to me. And I, I, um, and I would say to what you just said about Sangha that um, I also like can, like can see how in the somatic community I'm in, we work so deeply together and there's just like a real uh, intimacy in the work, but also in, in, um, in exploring things together where we're, I feel like every, you know, everyone's sort of a student and we all learn so much from one another because there's a big, practice probably in all of semantics but in the sort of modality I'm in which I also won't name uh just sort of for doxing reasons um there's just a, like a ton of sort of sharing and a ton of learning that clearly arises in the classroom from everyone being together and and being sensitive to 
uh, the tone of the room and the tone of one another together. So it very much feels like spiritual practice to me and has been a way of um, uniting, um, or, or maybe I don't like uniting, yeah, integrating um, a kind of anything in my life I could call a practice. And so, but I, and I do have this experience of the person who is my mentor of, I mean, I think she's a genius and I have this experience of her um, sometimes like when I'm teaching of uh, saying words that either sound like her or that sound like something bigger than me and, and just even when like I like something of her is certainly in me for sure and uh, but that's like a two-way street I feel like I even I feel like I stumbled upon her and yet something sort of you know there was sort of a like a basin of attraction is how I've been thinking about these kinds of things a lot lately where, because she seems like such a perfect fit in, um, in offering perspectives that for me have like sort of, again, integrated what somatics are with what yoga can be with what non-duality may or may not be who fucking knows, but, <laughs> um, and, uh, and she's also a, but I, she definitely feels like a, well, is that true? She certainly feels like a teacher to me. And I know that in our community, she's trying to be more of a peer, which is interesting too, because the community isn't about, it is about um, having clear containers so that there aren't sort of, I don't know what I want to say, like, depending on what we were talking about, and I'm not talking about sex in these communities right now, there are places where it's really important to have a good container. And there are also places where I appreciate that she's doing sort of the hardest work for herself to melt into the community and be like, yes, I'm here offering expertise and what is a teacher anyway? It's someone who can offer their expertise so that we can each do the work inside or each sort of find the inner teacher really I, I, I that's a reflection that i think is extremely important and that it's been important to me anyway and uh that sort of breakdown of hierarchy i think could be important in a lot of spiritual communities not a breakdown of like respect but again the information certainly flows from her but she models so well how information like flows the other way and again that she's offering experts that is a kind of mirroring and not a one-way dissemination. That's inspiring. Yeah. That is super inspiring. Yeah. 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 And so she's kind of a meta teacher in a way, which actually seems really important to me. Yeah. Like she's teaching about teaching in the way she teaches. Right. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. Kind of unfailingly. It must be exhausting, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's well put. Yeah. I, I, can I make one more little comment? Please. That, that, that occurred to me while Booty was talking was that, um, that there's, there's a difference too between sort of, when I say we need more students and fewer teachers, uh, there's a difference between teaching something kind of basic and practical like meta practice, which is very clear. Like I can walk into the room you can tell me about it and then I can go do it on my own. Um, or like somatic modalities in which there's, it's a, it's a little more vague, but there's kind of a clear sense of like what it is that you're learning versus, you know, a lot of Buddhist teachers. And I think there's an economics to this too. A lot of Buddhist teachers aren't actually just teaching that you don't walk into the room and they sort of say, okay, today we're going to, uh, you know, read this chapter of the Majima Nikaya. They, they, you know, it's what happens is you walk into the room and they kind of hold forth and talk. And, and, and after you walk out of the lecture, you say, wow, that was really profound. I'm not really sure what they were talking about, but, but, uh, but the sure was cool. And, um, that 
I feel like is that I think that there's a there's a reason there's an economic reason again kind of coming back to what we were saying that that um, if you are gonna hang out a shingle as a Buddhist teacher uh, if you're actually just saying okay what I'm gonna teach you is a proper sitting posture that's done pretty quickly and you're not gonna get a lot of repeat you know students because once you know how to do it you know how to do it. But if what you say is I'm going to teach you and that means I'm going to sort of weave a web of dharma around you with the hint that I am enlightened and you could be, you poor sop, then you can really kind of, it's, it's economically a much more viable kind of a thing, right? Because you can kind of keep people coming back in the door every week and maybe even paying for retreats. And there's big money in, in retreats and workshops, you know, weekend workshops. Uh, you can kind of really make a pretty good living doing that. Whereas if all you're doing is, you know, you have a little street corner and you sort of say, here, I'll show you how to how to put your butt on a cushion. and 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 these are the stages of sort of wishing well for other human beings. Um, once you, once everybody in the village has stopped by one time, you're, you're done. Um, and then you've got to go get a job. Uh, so I know, I know that sounds very cynical, but that's part of what I mean when I say we need more, more good students and fewer bad teachers. Well, can I say, I feel like the sinister side too, is that, um, I mean, I am a teacher and so I've wrestled with feelings of like, both imposter syndrome and like egotism around it and try to keep both in check. And, um, uh, but there's a kind of even more, there's like the perverse incentivism of um, like the fiscal economy or like making money so you can live. And then, it, but, it, but because of the um, context in which we find ourselves there, that's really disentangleable from a, a kind of, like you said, the attention economy or a kind of ego economy too, where I see a lot of uh, like ignorance in the entwinement of that, where maybe almost to, to get over imposter syndrome, which I would say I, I personally tend to be, tend to, my pen, pendulum tends to swing towards that. <laughs> um, and, uh, but like, did I lose my train of thought? Anyway, there's something, uh, I just wonder about that in the sort of like, like how much room there is for sort of illusion and ignorance to take hold because of the incentive of survival then becoming a sort of like uh, an egoic incentive yep. it, where you start to kind of believe yep. the lie you have to tell yourself. Yep. And I don't want to say like, like for me, I, I, uh, I'm not saying it's good to have imposter syndrome. That's sort of a, uh, self-centeredness in the other direction right but yeah. like that uh but i just i just can't help but feel that that's some of the like the push for people to become teachers too soon is frankly because i mean i can say in the context of yoga because i'm a yoga teacher it sounds cool people want a cool seemingly glamorous job turns out it's not <laughs> but that's another story and i definitely see that in a lot of our mutuals for instance about sort of like like attempting to shill some kind of expertise in spiritual coaching. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. Yeah. I, I got one more thing to say before we sign off, Tashin. Mm -hmm. That I also regard you as a, as an older brother. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Very interesting. Why? Why is that? <laughs> because you're amazing, and because you're so you're so brave. And, uh, you know, you model so well how to kind of, uh, how to kind of be hospitable to other beings, uh, by sort of being, being utterly unafraid of appearing awkward or foolish, uh, but also just being really frank and earnest and sharing your own practice in a way that I find deeply inspiring. And, uh, and I really, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to be more like you when I grow up. 
Uh, well, thank you for reflecting that. And uh, that's the beauty of peer relationships is we can all learn from each other. So I'm so grateful we've had time to share and talk about so many important topics and uh, learn from each other about them. And really thank you, you both for joining and uh, for this conversation. So thank you so much. <clears throat>